Welcome to church today. Take your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. While you turn there, just want to uh, shoot a few things your way that's important. Uh, first of all, uh, many of you have signed up already for Serve Day. 350 of you have signed up for Serve Day. And while that's great, I just want you to know we're pushing for more. Everybody say more. We are believing God for 500 volunteers on that day. In order to make that happen, many of you need to listen to the Lord and respond to him in obedience and say, yeah, I'm going to lend myself on that day to help people who need the love of Jesus and practical help in many ways. And so there are people set up all across the commons when you leave this morning where you can go by, sign up, get more information about the survey coming up in September. We really want you to help us in this regard to make a major impact upon Visalia and Tulare County. Also, uh, ladies, you have a Bible study. It's already meeting on Tuesday nights, and we have heard some of your uh, needs that you have with regard to some of these programming issues, and we're providing child care for the Tuesday night Bible study. If that helps you, then please help us help you today by seeing some of the ladies that are posted out in the commons. Uh, they have QR codes and other things by which you can let them know of your need for child care, and they will begin to make plans accordingly so that you can participate in the Tuesday night uh, Bible study for ladies. Also, uh, the Bible for grownups, Wednesday nights. Be sure and come. Uh, bring your kids for all the stuff that's happening campus wide. It'll be a great time to be together midweek. Well, I'm so glad you're here. So glad to launch this new series called The Gospel According to ESPN. We're talking about football this morning. In a moment, I'll read you a scripture as I'll be preaching a message called Going for the Goal. I just want you to see this jersey I have on. It's from the world champion Rams, Matthew Stafford. Okay, all right. So uh, I, I feel some disappointment from the Raider Nation in the room. And uh, you're crazy anyway. You need therapy, so... I don't feel that bad about it. But in the first service, I, ran, I wore a Derek Carr jersey. You saw that out there. This jersey, the Stafford jersey and the Derek Carr jersey will be given away and we'll post the winners tomorrow on Facebook and Instagram, maybe even this evening into tomorrow. So look at Facebook, Instagram. We'll be doing a drawing to give that away. And also at the end of this service, we have a giveaway for two tickets to a Fresno State Bulldog game. And so we'll be drawing that out at the very end of the service. You must be present to win, so don't run off. We wanna be able to bless you with that. But this morning we are uh, talking about going for the goal. Take 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, follow with me. The Bible says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run? but only one gets the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Let's pray. Father, this morning, thank you, Lord, for this new series that's beginning. Lord, this, this series will only find its full effect as we invite people to come who are lost and far away from you. I pray, God, that you will inspire your people to do that in the weeks to come. And we're believing, Lord, for a harvest of souls then and a harvest of souls now as people begin to realize the tremendous, powerful love that you have for them. So, Lord, today I pray for people that are away from you that they'll be found. I pray for people who are found that are weary and in pain that, Lord, today you will infuse their heart with faith and strength and hope and that, Lord, will leave this place transformed by your mind power for it's in Jesus name we pray and everyone said amen. amen going for the goal in our theme passage this morning we discovered that the apostle Paul must have been a sports fan because he's using imagery from sports to convey a spiritual message which is what we're doing over the next five weeks in this series called the gospel according to ESPN he's not talking about football like we're going to talk about this morning but he's talking about the NFL of his time it was competitive running and they are running a race and he says at the end that they get a prize that will not last last but we are running for a prize that will last forever in eternity and so this morning, as you can see, when you entered the building in the commons, we have all kinds of sports stuff set up to really prepare your heart and mind for the lessons that can come to you this morning, that can instruct you and build up your faith as it relates to lessons from sports that speaks into our life. But I'm so thankful for this time of year. I always am as we're coming out of the summer months and we begin to move into the fall. Uh, I'm always reminded that we're moving into one of the most energized seasons of the year, football season. If you feel that way about football season, will you say hoop, holler, clap, whatever? Hey, all right. 
from Pop Warner football to high school to college to the NFL, thousands of people, many of you in this room have all kinds of fall football rituals. Uh, maybe it's religiously watching Monday Night Football. Maybe it's getting a, a hot dog and popcorn at the local high school game. In fact, let me just ask you this. And, and ladies, I'm sorry because when we talk about football, that's primarily a guy's sport. It's almost exclusively a guy's sport. So let me just talk to the guys for a second. Guys, whenever you hear the marching band in town practicing, don't you feel just a little bit of boyhood adrenaline that just kind of rises up in you that says, I could literally take somebody out today. I could just like tackle somebody. Anybody feel that way? Man, oh man, I'm preaching the wrong crowd today. No, I think we all feel that way. There's something about that that triggers this excitement in our heart for the glory days from our gridiron times. And I want to tell you, there's a lot this morning that you can learn about football in your faith and in your life as we extract these principles. And I want to share with you some really strong parallels between life, football, and faith today. Let's begin with lesson number one. Look in your notes. You can write it down this morning. In football, as well as life, the game is a contact sport. It's a contact sport. Football can be a vicious game. If you've seen the recent movies in the, in the last few years, one in particular with Will Smith that talks about CTE, the brain trauma that happens after repeated hits in football, you begin to learn very quick that football is a very vicious game. It is, uh, it is a, a sport where athletes get bigger and stronger and faster. The ferociousness of the game is breathtaking. And if you will, I want to kind of acquaint you with the ferociousness of the game this morning by allowing you to watch a video. I want to encourage you to ooh and awe ah when you see some of these hits that you're about to see. And I want you to watch this video to learn why I respectfully retired from football in my junior high years. Please watch the screen. Did you see that dude's helmet come off? I think his head was inside that thing. Football is a ferocious sport. It is a contact sport. Can you imagine with me for a second, you have this hulk of a man, six foot, six inches tall, more than 350 pounds, who can run faster than you can. Like you are running away from this guy and he still can catch up to you. Can you imagine hitting that guy head on at full speed? Wow. Imagine the pain. Life, like football, is a contact sport. But some of you here this morning are going through things in your life that is creating pain for you that's more ferocious than a six foot six, 350 pound lineman who can run the 40 in 4.5 seconds. Some of you are dealing with some stuff in your life now where you would prefer to face that guy head on rather than dealing with some of the stuff you're dealing with right now. Many of us know the the pain that comes with the contact. We we know what goes through our hearts and our minds when we go through these bone-crushing moments when someone says, I don't love you anymore. When a spouse walks out. When the devastating diagnosis is spoken when the business went bankrupt, when the kids rebelled, when the consequences of your personal failure seems to swallow you alive. In those moments, the consequences of the outcome of the game are far bigger than a win or a loss in a statistician's table. No, this is a matter of life and death. And some of you are going through some life and death stuff right now and you realize that it's punishing, that life is a contact sport that you are having to live through. And suddenly when you begin to process that, this ginormous football player seems kind of small in comparison with these things. And most of us have lived long enough to know that life like football is a contact sport. So here's the second lesson, write this one down. When the contact comes, The outcome is pain, so please understand in life and in football, number two, you have to play through the pain. We wish we could give up. We wish we could throw up our hands. We wish we could just roll over, not get out of bed, 
But please know that in life and in football, because of contact, pain is inevitable. It is a common knowledge in sports that all players are called upon at one time or another to play through the pain. All of us admire the tenacity of world-class competitors like Tiger Woods who can win the Masters with torn ligaments in his knee and a double fracture in his tibia. But most of us, we just wouldn't even show up to the office that day. We, we wouldn't get out there and, and endure that kind of agony and suffering, yet world-class competitors will even play through the pain and compete at the highest of levels in order to win, in order to compete for a prize that, according to our passage this morning, says won't last. Yet we in life are pl- pr- uh, playing for a crown, a prize that will never fade away, one that will last for all of eternity. But many of us, even though the stakes are much higher, are ready to give up and quit. In the NFL, to play through the pain is considered the warrior's code. I read an article some time ago about a former San Diego Charger, at that time San Diego Charger football player, Sean Merriman, who decided to play through his season with two torn ligaments in his knee. His former player, the Charger great Ladanian Tomlinson, said this about Sean. He said, how do you tell a warrior to sit down? That's what he is. He's a warrior. He's trained for this. It's hard to tell a guy to sit down. But some of us, we're not like that. We're not built with a warrior's code. We're we're willing to give in, to give up, to give over to the pain of our life. When we encounter the bone crushing realities of life, it's a strong temptation to want to just sit down, give up, throw up our hands and say, I'm done. I'm done. Listen, if this is what's living for God is like, I'm done. If this is what marriage is like, I'm done. If this is what life in the workplace is like, I'm done. So easy to begin to entertain the seductive questions that come to our heart in the painful times of life that cause us to ponder, is God real? Does God love me? And if he loves me, why does he allow me to go through all this pain? I mean, if God is really as big and as powerful as Pastor Mark says he is, and he can do all these great things, then why am I in the mess I'm in? Why am I going through the hurts I'm going through? It's precisely in these moments that we need to seek God's wisdom and knowledge concerning our life. It's in the pain that the big issues of life come into focus. The pain of our life, the big issues that we deal with, cause all the smaller issues to to burn away in the periphery and for us to see what really matters and to see that God is good, that God does love us, that he is faithful even when we are faithless, that we begin to question the big questions of life. What on earth am I here for? What is my destiny? Is there a plan for my life that will lead me out of my pain and into the fulfillment and contentment that God has promised me? It's in this moment that we learn our next life lesson for football. Fill in this blank, number three, in football as well as life, you need to be careful about who's calling your place. In football, the coach will wear a headset. I think you're gonna see it on the the screen up here. He's wearing a headset. There he is, Sean McVay. And uh, contrary to popular belief, I know some of you don't follow football, maybe some of the ladies, maybe some of the guys, you don't follow football. Uh, Contrary to popular belief, he is not listening to music to help him relax right now, okay? Just want to clear that up for you. No, instead of music that's helping him to chill out and deal with the stress of the game, he's got all these voices that are inside that headset from his coaches that are up in the press box way above the field that's giving him perspective and strategy and direction on how to win the game. And so from these guys up in the press box, you see them up there, they're looking at things from a context he can't see it in. How many's following with me today? And he begins to, they begin to call in these plays and then he begins to call in the play to the quarterback that's on the field. Now it seems kind of unfair to me why we wouldn't just let the quarterback call the play. I mean, he's the one on the field. He's the one getting hit. He's the one throwing the ball. Uh, He's the one that's, that's gonna get tackled and go through all these things. He's the most visible player on the field. So why don't we just let the quarterback call the play? Everybody tracking with me? Because the perspective from above is more, is stronger, more powerful, and more discerning than the perspective from being on the field. It's hard sometimes to keep godly spiritual perspective, to keep life in its proper balance when we're getting hit all the time. It's hard to 
to see things on the same level. Sometimes you need someone who's above the playing field that's lending to you wisdom and strategy and direction that you don't possess within yourself. This morning, we've already established that life is a contact sport, that because of contact, it's inevitable that pain will come into our life. But the real burning question I have for you this morning is as those of you that are in pain and you're contemplating your next big move, I want to know who's calling your place. Is it your friends in the nightclub? Please tell me it's not your friends in the nightclub. Anytime you hear that, whatever comes out of their mouth, it's bad. It's the devil speaking, okay? Do you notice that guy my age? I'm just kind of keeping it in the zone, keeping it in the zone, keeping it in the zone. Pray for me. <laughs> Please tell me this morning that the person that's calling your play is not that coworker of yours who is more miserable than you are, who's blown it 12, 14, 18, 25 times, and you're seeking your life's direction from him or her. Please tell me it's not them. Please tell me this morning that you're not a self-made man or a self-made woman, and you're calling your own place. You see, friends, as you're contemplating your next big move in response to the pain and the surprise and the disappointments and all the junk you're going through in your life, you need a perspective that's above the field that gives you a sense of wisdom and peace and direction that you cannot possibly possess in yourself or your friends in the bar or your coworkers on the job. You need heaven's perspective. In fact, the very reason that you may be here today is that you need to hear a word from God, something that God would speak into your life that seems totally crazy and illogical to your friends in the bar, something that seems totally crazy and illogical to your friend on the job, something that you yourself have difficulty believing within your own heart and mind, but something that God speaks into your life to say, this is the way, walk in it. This is your way to peace. This is your way to blessing. This is your way to life. This is your way to healing. We need a perspective this morning that's above the field. Would you say amen this morning? You see, how good is your perspective from the trenches? Could it be this morning that a perspective from above could be the answer? Today, we need to stop calling our own place long enough to find out what God says about our life. Because here's what I can tell you, when you're on the field in the mud and the blood and the pain, and you're there with your friends in the nightclub, and you're there with your friend on the job, and you're trying to call your own shots, you will have a faulty perspective about who you are and how you relate to God. Because from that perspective, from the world's perspective, we are unlovable and rejected, unforgivable and dirty, worthless and without value. We are common and ordinary. But when you can begin to be delivered from the perspective of life in the trenches and you can begin to see it from God's perspective from above. God says about you that you are loved and accepted, forgiven and cleansed, worthy and valuable, exceptional and extraordinary. So some of us are going through life in a default mode of defeat simply because we're not gaining the right perspective for our lives. Do you realize today that God who desires to call your place, who desires to lead you through the steps that are necessary in life is absolutely crazy about you? You say, pastor, you're a liar. Nobody's ever been crazy about me. I don't, I, I, nobody's been crazy. I bring crazy. I'm the source of crazy. I, I take crazy with me wherever I go, but nobody's ever been crazy about me because there's nothing to love. I wanna tell you, friends, you're listening to the wrong perspective. The wrong person is calling your place. If you can begin to listen to what God says about you and feels about you, you will begin to realize that your life has much more potential, destiny, and promise than you ever dreamed possible. But you've gotta listen to the right person today. Because today, God is absolutely in love with you and desires to lead you through your life. So not only does God desire to call your place, but he's also provided some help. Here's our fourth lesson. Fill in the blank this morning in football and in life. We need somebody to block for you. You need somebody to block for you. Okay. Let me take off my glasses so I can see you out here in the crowd for a second. Uh, okay, so I want to talk to people who played football. So if you've played football at some time throughout your life, I quit in seventh grade. <laughs> so I, but I played. Uh, how many of you ever played any time in your life, junior high, high school, football? Could you all raise your hands, please? Leave them lifted for a second. Leave them up there. Okay, I'm looking around. Keep them up there for a second. Okay, all right. All right, back down for a second, please. All right, so now I'm going to begin to sift the crowd a little bit. 
Uh, if you were a skill player, meaning you were a quarterback, a running back, a wide receiver, uh, something like that, uh, and you played football, would you please raise your hand right now? Could you raise and leave it lifted? Folks, can we please welcome all the pretty boys this morning? Can we <laughs> welcome all the pretty boys? All right. Now, now, if, if you fall in a different category, I'm going for another group now and particularly on the offensive side, and you played guard or tackle or center, uh, one of those type of linemen folks, w would you please raise your hand right now? Folks, let's, let's welcome Shrek this morning. Please <laughs> welcome, welcome Shrek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you see, the, the skill players, those, those are the glory boys. They're the ones that get all the girls. Uh, like, they're the ones that, like, run off into the sidelines, take their helmet off, and, like, four cheerleaders kiss them all at the same time. It's just, it's amazing. They're the ones that get their, their, their faces in the newspaper. They're the ones that everybody looks at. I mean, they're the ones that everybody celebrates. But without Shrek, these boys don't have a prayer. In fact, there are times in which a skilled player will get a little big for his britches. He'll get a little inflated, a little arrogant. And so here's how these big linemen bounce the score. Here's how Shrek does it. He gets down there on the line. They say, down, set, hut. And he goes like this. <laughs> and they get tackled and they get hurt and they get sacked for losses and they look like a loser and nobody wants to take their picture for the newspaper. And Shrek's up there saying, see how much you need me? So I, before you leave today, all you pretty boys, you need to go find a Shrek and in a very heterosexual way, kiss that dude on the mouth. Just do that, okay? <laughs> Kiss him on the mouth. You don't know how blessed you are until somebody's blocked for you. And in life, God is so good that he calls our place, but God is even better in that he has provided some folks to block for us. It's called Team Jesus, which is called the church. Can somebody give the Lord a hand for the church? And some of you are here this morning and you're not sure how you feel about God. And the reason you're not sure how you feel about God is you're not sure how you feel about the church. Can I tell you, you really don't have a problem with God. It's his kids you have a problem with. Okay. You say, yeah, the, yeah, the organized religion. I don't even know what I'm doing here today. I don't know why I came this thing's all like a bunch of bull for me. I don't like this. I don't like Christians. They say one thing and do another. And they, they seem to espouse values that they themselves don't live out in their lives. Yeah. Yeah, they can be judgmental and narrow and intolerant and bigoted from my perspective. Okay. Christians have let me down. When I really needed someone, they couldn't be found. I got burnt in a church situation in the past. Here, here is my grand, deep theological answer to all that. So what? I want to tell you that I'm the lead pastor and I'm the chief of being inconsistent and imperfect. And everybody that I know in my life is also inconsistent and imperfect. And what I've found about people who are Christians is that we're all in a process of struggling, and I want to emphasize that word struggling, to become a little more like Jesus every day. And from point A to point B of when we start and when we finish in heaven, it's a hot mess. There are ups and there are downs, and there are times when we're spiritual and we're very unspiritual. And I will tell you, friends, that will continue from now until we draw our last breath. Here's a revelation for you. People are people, and some of them go to church. So in that scenario, in that scheme, as you are feeling very hard feelings toward the church, I want to try to redeem that for you because that same group of imperfect people that we can point out all their faults and I can own, to, own up to all of mine, I will tell you that same group of people when I was hurting, they could be found. 
When I messed up and I blew it and I fell short of the glory of God, they were the first ones to pick me up and dust me off and set me on my feet again. When I was wounded beyond repair, they carried me back to the huddle and loved on me until I was ready to run again. That's what the church of Jesus Christ is for. And I will tell you that not every Christian and not every church will be the kind of example that you want it to be, but God has placed his people in your life to block for you, to make a way for you where there seems to be no way, to lift you up and be a safety net for you. You need the church of Jesus Christ. Finally, there's one more lesson. In football as well as life, joy is found when there's a touchdown. Joy is found when there's a touchdown. Isn't it fun when touchdowns happen? I don't know about you, I'm not really a fan of defensive struggles in football games. Like it, I don't walk away saying, boy, that was really a great game when someone kicked a field goal with no time remaining to overcome the other team three to two because the other team had a safety somewhere in the middle of the game. That's just not any fun to me. No, I, I come from a college football perspective. I come from Oklahoma, my beloved Sooners, uh, where we throw the ball. We never play defense. Um, we, we, we love scores like 363 to 362. Now that's a football game. People throwing the ball, people running the ball, people spiking the ball, people jumping up in the crowd. Sooner schooner running on the field, all that. I love all that stuff. I'm not so crazy about defensive struggles. And in college football, which is God's sanctified preference for football, just if you didn't know that, I can probably provide chapter and verse later. There are some exciting touchdown celebration traditions. One that I love so very much comes from Tallahassee, Florida, Florida State University, that when they score a touchdown, the Seminole warrior on an Appaloosa horse comes out and throws a stake, usually on fire. How killer is that? Right in the middle of the field. I mean, that's like bad to the bone. That's bad to the bone. Then we go to Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, they do the jump around. They play this song, the jump around. It kind of gets on my nerves, but they all kind of jump around. And then Bucky the Badger does push-ups. That's a little lame-o for me. But I, anyway, if you're a Wisconsin fan, I love it. It's, it's a great tradition. <laughs> then to my beloved Sooners in Oklahoma, when we score a touchdown, we fire a cannon. And then we come out in this horse and buggy uh, wagon thing, and we go all over the field. And if you'll remember about three years ago, we were going so fast that we literally turned it over and like fell apart right in the middle of the field. That is a tremendous metaphor for Oklahoma football. It's just, it says everything you need to know about us. But it's a great football tradition. And then one last one here. This comes from uh, University of Kansas. When they score a touchdown, they get up and wave their hands. It's called waving the wheat. This last happened in 1957. Uh, that's the last time they scored a touchdown. <laughs> if you're a Kansas fan, you can uh, send all your complaints to Mike Robertson at VisaliaFirst.com. But football traditions are fun. Why are football traditions so fun? Because when a team scores a touchdown, it completes the objective for which they were created. All you defensive folks, okay, just go to Lowe's, buy a ladder, and get over yourselves this morning, okay? <laughs> Teams were not created just for defense. They were created to score. That's how you win the game. So when they score a touchdown, that's the whole objective. That's the whole name of the game. And so in life, as we think about this and we begin to draw the parallels from football back to life and faith, how do we know in life and faith when we score a touchdown? Is it when you get a big raise or bonus at work? Well, that's pretty cool, but that's not a touchdown. How, how about when you move into your dream house that you've always wanted to live in? Man, that's incredible, but that's not a touchdown. Or, or what if you get to a place in life where a lot of people know your name and you're this celebrity fact, uh, uh, figure and, and you have all this esteem that comes your way? Well, man, not many people in life get to do that, but that's still not a touchdown. You see, because none of those things that I just mentioned to you are things that you were created for. What were you created for? You were created to love God to know him and to make him known. So a touchdown occurs when you come into a living relationship with Jesus where his blood washes over your life and takes away all your sin. The presence of God comes into your life and prepares you to live with him for eternity. That's a touchdown. 
A touchdown occurs when you live that life in such a way that people become attracted to your life and you share with them the life-changing message that you have received and as a result, their sins are forgiven and they come into a saving knowledge of Jesus. That too is another touchdown. All these other things are great. They are awesome. I pray those blessings over your life. I want you to experience them, but do not get the cart before the horse. They are not touchdowns. They are not the objectives for which you're created. They're simply things that enhances and helps you along the way to get where you need to go. The whole objective of life is built and surrounded by this idea of living for God and serving him. That's a touchdown. It's a touchdown when you live your life for him. But pastor, what happens is there a celebration. Oh yeah, buddy. The Bible says that all the angels in heaven begin to celebrate. I imagine them spiking footballs. Probably not happening, but I like it. It preaches better. Okay. And then number two, the Lord Jesus writes your name in the, the greatest roster of the greatest team that's ever been assembled called the Lamb's Book of Life. And then after that, when it's time to hang up our pads and our helmet, and we go walking back off the field for the last time, it's Jesus who is there to give us a high five and say, welcome, good and faithful player. Enter into the joys of the Lord. Enter into the hall of faith forever and ever and ever and ever. That's a touchdown. As the musicians come this morning, I know that life's tough. Like you, I felt the pain. I've told you some of my stories. I'm not going to rehash them this morning. But I want you to know that you were created to be more and do more than you ever thought possible. Even though life is really hard on a lot of you, and I sense that today. I sense some heaviness in the room. I want you to know that you were created for more and you can do more than you ever thought possible. You say, but Pastor, it is so hard. You don't know what it's like living in my skin. You don't know what it's like, the things I go through and the trials I've seen. And man, you, you think your life's tough. I'll, I'll compare some war stories with you. And you, you weren't abused like I was abused. You, 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 didn't, you weren't forsaken and, and, and left an orphan, left behind like I was. And people have been mean to you and you haven't been discriminated against. And blah, we can go all down the line of all the things that has happened in our lives. Friends, I just want you to know that you can do more and be more than you ever thought possible. And at the moment you feel like quitting, you've got to keep going. Some of you feel like you're in a death crawl right now. How many knows what a death crawl is? Can you lift your hand? It's a really old school football thing. Uh, the guy gets down in the four-point stance. I hope I don't throw my back out this morning. <laughs> like this. Oh, that was ugly. That was really ugly. <laughs> and another guy crawls on his back, and he begins to carry him down the field. It's called the death crawl. The death crawl. Every step hurts. Arms are quivering, legs are quivering. You just wanna throw in the towel. It's a, it's a way to build resilience. It's a way to build endurance, tenacity, toughness, all of that. But some of you really feel like you're in the midst of that right now and you just wanna throw in the towel and say, I'm done. It's time for me to check out. Like pastor, I'm gonna retire from football in the seventh grade because this is not what I signed up for. Can I invite you to watch this video, this one last video today before we leave? I want you to discover some meaning in the midst of what you're going through. What, am I in trouble now? Not yet. I want to see you do the death crawl again, except I want to see your absolute best. <laughs> <laughs> what, you want me to go to the 30? I think you can go to the 50. The 50? I can go to the 50 if nobody's on my back. I think you can do it with Jeremy on your back. But even if you can, I want you to promise me you're going to do your best. All right. Your best. Okay. You going to give me your best? I'm going to give you my best. All right, one more thing. I want you to do it blindfolded. Why? Because I want you giving up at a certain point when you can go further. Get down. Jeremy, get on his back. I get a good tight hold, Jeremy. All right. Let's go, Brock. Keep your knees off the ground, just your hands and feet. There you go. A little bit left. A little bit left. There you go. Show me good effort. That way, Brock. You keep coming. There you go. It's a good start. A little bit left. A little bit left. There you go, Brock. Good strength. Yeah, 
<laughs> That's it, Brock. That's it. I'm out of the 20 yet? Forget the 20. You give me your best. You keep going. That's it. No, don't stop, Brock. You got more in you than that. I ain't done. I'm just resting a second. You gotta keep moving. Let's keep moving. Let's go. Don't quit till you got nothing left. There you go. Keep moving. Keep moving. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. You keep driving. Keep your knees off the ground. Keep driving it. Your very best. Your very best. Your very best. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. That's it. That's it. Keep going. Don't quit on me. Keep going. Keep driving it. Keep driving. Keep your knees off the ground. That's it. Your very best. Don't quit on me. Your very best. Keep driving. Keep driving. There you go. There you go. That's it. You keep driving. Keep your knees off the ground. Keep driving it. Don't quit till you got nothing left. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. That's it. That's it. Keep going. I want everything you got. Come on, keep going. It hurts. Don't quit on me. Your very best. Keep driving. Keep driving. There you go. There you go. He's heavy. I know he's heavy. I'm bad out of strength. Then you negotiate with your body to find more strength, but don't you give up on me, Brock. You keep going, you hear me? You keep going. You're doing good. You keep going. Do not quit on me. You keep going. It hurts. I know it hurts. You keep going. You keep going. It's all hard from here. 30 more steps. You keep going, Brock. Come on. Keep going. Burn. And let it burn. 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 It's all hard. You keep going, Brock. Come on. Come on. Keep going. You promised me your best. Your best. Don't stop. Keep going. Too hard. It's not too hard. You keep going. Come on, Brock. Give me more. Give me more. Keep going. 20 more steps. 20 more. Keep going, Brock. Give me your best. Don't quit, no, keep going, keep going, keep going. Don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. Brock Kelly, you don't quit. Keep going, keep going. Go, Brock Kelly, you don't quit on me. No, you keep going, you keep going. Go, Brock Kelly, you don't quit on me. No, you keep going, you keep going. Go, Brock, ten more steps, ten more, ten more, ten more. Keep going, don't quit. Give me your heart. You can, you can. Five more, five more, come on, Brock, come on, don't quit, don't quit, come on, Brock, two more, one more. Oh. Let's go to the city, let's go to the city, I'll have any more. Look up, Brock, you're in the end zone. Some of you right now, you're saying, Pastor, the divorce hurts. I'm telling you, keep going. Bankruptcy, it hurts. The lawsuit, it hurts. The betrayal, it hurts. Keep going, keep going. I don't think my arms can stand it. I feel like jello. Keep going. Pastor, I, I can't see where I'm going. I don't know where all this is leading. I don't know when it's gonna stop. Keep going, keep going, keep going. You see, you may be in a death crawl, but there's something that God is leading you toward. There's something that your life is going to accomplish. There is something you're going to celebrate one day. Second Corinthians 4, 8 through 14. You're gonna see it on the screen this morning. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body. We always carry around on our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be in us. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken with that same spirit of faith. We also believe and therefore speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. Touchdown. 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 
That's the moment, folks, when you look up and you realize that you've crossed the goal. That's when you look up and realize that you've made it. That's when you realize that everything that you've suffered for, everything that you've given up, everything that you've sacrificed, everything that you've committed to God has now come back to you for eternity so that no joy will ever be withheld from you. No sorrow will ever come near to you. In that moment, it'll be a touchdown for life and eternity. Father, this morning, I wanna thank you right now that you're leading us towards something. Every sorrow, every pain, every hurt, every disappointment, every betrayal, everything that we experience, Lord, it's all leading somewhere. And so, Lord, I pray right now for people who are in the midst of it, that God, you'll strengthen them with hope and faith, that the glory of your presence would fill them. But, Lord, now I also pray for those that are far away from you, people who are right now just not, not sure whether they're going to give up, give up, give in, throw in the towel, if they're just going to walk away from life and faith and God and everything else. Lord, today, capture them. Capture their heart. Capture their heart with hope, forgiveness, love, peace, joy, whatever they need, Lord, whatever they're longing for. Please, Lord, fill them with those qualities this morning. Father, we just believe right now that you're about to change lives. Holy Spirit, come now and change lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. How many say, Pastor, I'm far away from God. Maybe today you're needing to make a rededication of your life. Maybe you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Maybe you've known him, but now you're far away from him. You're in what we would call a backslidden condition where you have fallen away from God after once serving him. Whatever the case may be, right now is your moment. Right now is your moment to overcome all the things of life that are challenging you, attacking you, coming against you by saying, I am going to serve Jesus. I'm going to serve Jesus and not look back. I'm going to serve Jesus until I cross the goal line. I'm going to serve Jesus until I receive that touchdown. Today, I'm determined with everything in my heart to serve the living Lord Jesus Christ with everything I have in my life. If that's you, if I'm talking to you today, would you just lift up your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. That's me. Yeah, bless you. One, two, yeah, three. Yeah, all across the Lord. How about up in the risers? You say, Pastor, that's me. You just lift me. I see you, sir. Thank you. Up in the risers again. Yeah, ma'am, I see you. Over here. Yeah, I see you in the top row, guys. Thank you. How many more? Over here. Yes, thank you. To my left, all the way over to the side. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for lifting your hand. Thank you right now. Come on, everybody, pray this prayer out loud with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I surrender. I give up to you. I do not give up to my circumstances. Fill me now with hope. Fill me with your presence. Make me clean, brand new, full of hope, full of joy, full of love, full of forgiveness. Jesus, I will serve you until I cross the goal line. Jesus, I will serve you until I hear touchdown. I give everything to you now. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand.